With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news, you can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube movies and shows. Today, we tackle the challenge of aging eyes head-on. If you ever noticed your arms aren't long enough anymore, or you find yourself struggling with close-up vision after hitting the big 4-0, well, you're in the right place. Today, we will discuss the latest advancements in eye drops designed to restore your near focus and share practical tips for navigating life with presbyopia, which is age-related loss of near vision. Today's guest, California optometrist, optometrist Dr. Milton Hom. Dr. Ham is an internationally recognized expert and researcher in therapeutics, dry eye, presbyopia, presbyopic meiotic drops, contact lenses, and allergy. Dr. Ham has written four books and has published over 200 papers and peer-reviewed abstracts. Dr. Ham, welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast with Dr. Kerry Gelb. Hey, thank you, Kerry. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. Um, I was looking forward to... Um, talking to you again, I remember the probably years, I don't know if you remember, but years and years ago, uh, you did a lecture on diabetes in the eye. And I thought, you know, even to this day, uh, I still quote you from that lecture. I mean, it was just, I, I mean, I learned so much about that diabetes in the eye, especially when you started talking about soft drinks and weight gain and things like that. I mean, it's just your perspective on things from the point of view of, let's say the systemic point of view was just you know, something I haven't heard before, but I just was really, really looking forward to seeing you again. Well, I certainly appreciate that. And I'm glad you finally woke up from the lecture. So, <laughs> so I do want to ask you, you know, we're going to talk about eye drops that make your pupils small so you could read. Do these drops really work? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, when you take a look at presbyopia, I mean, uh, Actually, when we think about presbyopia and we think about reading glasses, we only think about, you know, classically, we think about uh, only one part of it, and that is accommodation. In other words, the eye, uh, the lens inside the eye is not able um, to change power anymore, and that's the reason why we can't see, and it's called accommodation. But in actuality, uh, seeing near uh, isn't just all about accommodation. There's also something that we call the near triad. And what the near triad is, is that it's accommodation, it's convergence where you have the eyes pointing at a particular um, object or uh, close vision and meiosis, which is actually a smaller pupil. So actually a smaller pupil or meios uh, meiosis uh, is actually a part of the near triad and actually will enable us to see up close. And uh, the drops that are out there now and the drops that are development, most of them are centered around making the pupil smaller. And by making this pupil smaller, um, we're able to see up close. So yeah, absolutely, they work. You know, this may have happened to you. It's happened to me a number of times. 
I have a patient who's in their early 40s and I tell them they need reading glasses. And I've actually had patients start crying because of it. And if you could explain to people why they lose their vision when they get close to 40 or over 40 and what that condition is, presbyopia. Well, essentially what presbyopia is, is, you know, usually hits around age 40 and, and, and older. And what happens is, is that uh, you aren't able to see up close. And it happens uh, gradually over maybe a few years that your, your up close vision um, is not as good. So what you have to do is because it's not as good, then you have to see things further and further and further out. Um, it's just a normal part of, uh, of aging. Um, it's not like a, a horrible disease or something that you're going to die for or go blind from. What it is, is that, uh, it's just a normal part of aging. And we do have a lot of options to treat it. And epidemiologically, how many people actually have this in the U S? Oh, millions, millions and millions and millions. It's probably, um, it's almost like uh, I'll tell my patients, uh, sooner or later, you're going to need reading glasses. So uh, sooner or later, uh, it catches up with most of us. So yeah, just. Yeah, you know, like it's about 128 million people out of the 330 million people, 40% of the population of the U.S., 2 billion worldwide. So this is a, a common problem. And uh, people have been dealing with this for years and in countries where you know, very third world countries that are very, very poor and people that are working. And then all of a sudden they hit their 40s and 50s. It becomes very hard for them to do their job. Gary, you, you've been doing your homework. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that a lot better than I could. Well, well, I mean, you know, it is, it, it is said where people, you know, no longer can do their job when they get into their 50s and 60s and in countries where it's so exp they don't have enough money even to buy the the cheap reading that we consider in this country just over the counter cheap reading glasses that you really you know you have to feel for these people oh absolutely and you know what's also interesting is is that um there is a theory that actually it's what's ambient heat is also something that will bring this on faster so in other words what they've done is that uh, years ago, they did a study showing uh, internationally uh, what is the uh, age of onset. In other words, uh, what age is it when you start feeling this presbyopia? And uh, they went ahead and they surveyed uh, doctors uh, internationally all across the world. And what they found was is that the ones that are closest to the equator, the ones that uh, have higher uh, ambient temperatures uh, uh, year round, you're more likely to get presbyopia earlier than somebody who's in the colder climates. You know, when I got out of school and I did my residency, there was a medication called pilocarpine. And we used it for glaucoma and people would have these pinhole pupils and they would put the drop in, they would have to put it in four times a day. At that time we were using 4% pilocarpine. Pilocarpine came in different percentages. I remember we came in, I think in a, a half, a quarter, 1%, 2%, 4%. And people were pretty miserable. <clears throat> so what kind of medications can we use to be able to make the pupils smaller and people not so miserable? What's the goal of the medication? Well, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. Most of the um, presbyopia uh, eye drops that are out there and that are in development are all pilocarpine, just like what you say. And the reason why is, is because it makes the pupil smaller. So, uh, and you alluded to this earlier, you're talking about the pinhole effect. You know, you know, when you look through a pinhole, uh, all of a sudden you have this increase, what they call depth of focus. In other words, you're able to see at very, very many ranges. You'll be able to see at distance and also at close when you use the pinhole. Uh, the problem though, if you notice, if you ever use a pinhole is that a lot of times, you know, you're holding it up, you know, where uh, either at the corneal plane or let's say we're, uh, you know, right up against the eye and you look through it. What does that do to your visual field? In other words, your peripheral vision. Well, usually when you use a pinhole, what happens is your peripheral vision is, is really, really, really small. And not only that, but when you use a pinhole, what happens is, is that there's not enough light coming through. So it's very, very dim. So your vision, I mean, even though it's clear through a pinhole, it's very, very dim, hardly any light at all. And number two, you don't have any peripheral vision at all whatsoever. 
But what's interesting is, is that my, since when we talked about the near triad, we talked about meiosis, or should we talk about small pupils, part of being able to see close. So what it is, is that the way the eye is designed is that if you place that pinhole at the pupillary plane, in other words, if you make the pupil smaller, you get no restriction on your visual field. You'll still get full peripheral vision. And not only that, but you won't get any dimming of vision. It's only when you hold it up to your eye, that is when you get all of those pitfalls. But when it's actually on the pupillary plane where the pupil is smaller, you don't get any of those pitfalls. And it actually, that's the reason why you're able to see better up close with something like a, a smaller pupil drug, such as pilocarpine. Now, you know, with pilocarpine, we, it would affect accommodation and the muscle that, the, so that's the ciliary muscle and the, and, the, and the iris where the iris would get smaller. But ideally, we just want to make the iris smaller. Is that correct? You have been really doing your homework, Gary. Yeah. So what happens is, is that it's called ciliary spasm. What it is, is that you want to make the iris smaller. In other words, you want to have a smaller pupil. But the problem is, is that there is a side effect with pilocarpine and with some of the drugs. It's called a myopic shift. So what happens is, is that not only it makes the pupil smaller, but it changes your prescription. So that is what you'll see with a lot of the pilocarpine drugs. Now, there are newer ones that are out there. In other words, we were working on one that's called uh, the, the, the um, lens therapeutics, and uh, it's actually acyclidine. And what that is, is that it has that same effect or maybe a better effect on the pupil as pilocarpine, but it does not change your prescription. Because with pilocarpine, we could change the prescription if we're using that. I've seen up to three di three units. We call it diopters in the business. You know, three. Di I've seen three diopters even more uh, becoming more nearsighted. But with a cyclidine, maybe a quarter diopter change because we're really working on the the just the iris muscle, the sphincter. We're not working on the ciliary body to shift the prescription. Uh, so we're just getting a better. We're getting the pinhole effect with a better depth of field. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely correct. So uh, the studies have shown actually, you know, the shift is between a half a diopter or one half of a unit to about two diopters. Um, Gil Martin went ahead with 2% pilo and found out it was about 1.5 units of uh, nearsightedness that's induced with something like pilocarpine. Now, when they take a look at it compared with acyclidine, which is by lens therapeutics, of course, uh, it's a quarter uh, of a unit or even less. So in other words, you don't really get that myopic shift. So what, is, what does that mean? Does that mean anything? Well, the reason why, it, I'll tell you, I was part of the phase three study for this uh, acyclidine. And what it means is, is that, okay, so I was part of the Vuity studies, which is um, AbbVie's pilocarpine studies for presbyopia. And what we were told is that you are supposed to be, you have to wear your distance glasses in order for the drop to work, okay? If you're not wearing your distance glasses or if you're not distance corrected, you're not wearing contact lenses for distance or whatever it is, that drop is not going to work, okay? With pilocarpine. Acyclidine, when we went ahead and did the study, uh, I was asking, well, don't you, doesn't everybody have to be corrected for distance? Don't they have to wear the distance glasses? Are you going to be able to supply the distance glasses to the patients? This is what I was asking uh, Lens. And they were saying, no, we do not have to supply distance glasses. The patient can use their regular glasses and still see. And the reason why is because we don't have any myopic shift. So I, I, I first, I couldn't really believe it. But then as we went along, in the clinical study, we found that, yeah, the patient was still able to use their old reading glasses. They didn't have to get new reading glasses, or shall we say, they didn't have to get new distance glasses at all. They could just use their old distance, your progressives or whatever your existing one and use the drop on top of that. And it actually will help you see up close better. So what happens is, is that, you know, it's almost like there's a sweet spot with where these drops will work. I would say that the Vuity or the pilocarpine ones is probably the sweet spot like this, but with the newer next generation, the second generation of, let's say, acyclovine, the sweet side is much, much larger. So many more patients are able to, to be successful with it.
MacuHealth, your science-born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. What's the ideal pupil size? Because I know when they did, uh, when they did these, they tr they tried these implants that they put in the inlays. They called it uh, the Camara in inlays, and the pupil size was about one and a half, one point six pupil size. And they tried IOLs, you know, uh, with, and they had a pupil size of one point three six pupil aperture. But what do you think is the ideal pupil size? And what's the pupil size with a cyclidine compared to pilocarpine? <laughs> That's a real interesting question. So when I was part of the different pilocarpine studies as a, either as a PI, a principal investigator with the, doing the clinical study or as a consultant, uh, it was interesting because uh, in the past, you know, if you were to ask me last year, what is the optimal pupil size, the sweet spot pupil size uh, for somebody uh, for to use one of these drops so they'll be able to see up close uh, optimally, uh, I would say it was between two to three millimeters. But since I was part of this acyclidine trial, which brought it below two millimeters, and it was highly, highly successful, I think all of that literature, yeah, I was a co-author on the paper, you know, to wrote the two to three millimeters. I was a co I think it's all wrong now. I think you can get smaller. And when you get smaller, you increase your depth of focus. In other words, you increase your range. And what happens is, is that there again, you know, you increase your sweet spot as to what these patients will work. You know, if you take a look at the clinical study that was done for acyclidine, they pick patients that were between 45 years old and 75 years old. In other words, a very, very large age range. The other pilocarpine studies were actually much, much smaller age ranges, you know, 50 years old, 45 to 50 years old. So why is that? Why is it that acyclidine can work for a larger age range while pilocarpine can work for just a smaller age range. Well, the reason why is, is because when you get a smaller pupil, then you get a greater depth of focus. A greater depth of focus can be that interpreted as higher power. In other words, you get more power up at near. So when you get more power up and near, the older patients need more power up and near. So that's the reason why you have a larger uh, a sweet spot or a larger uh, area that you could do as opposed to pilocarpine. Another reason why is, is because I think with pilocarpine, you can only get like 1.5 units of close vision. But I think when you get with a smaller pupil size, uh, the optics show that actually you get a higher amount of power up close. And that's the reason why you get a larger sweet spot with acyclidine as opposed to, let's say, pilocarpine. And when do you think acyclidine, this new medication, will be available in the United States? Oh, I don't know. I think I think they're going to be submitting it to the FDA this year, and then probably won't be ne until next year, I would imagine. And how did they discover acyclidine? I, from what I understand, it was a glaucoma medication in Europe. It was a failed glaucoma medication in Europe. Absolutely, yes. And what happened was is that uh, this has been repurposed. A lot of the drugs we have, I mean, I do a lot of work in allergy. A lot of the work on you know drugs and allergy, antihistamines are repurposed for the eye. Uh, this is a classic case of, uh, you know, a glaucoma drop that failed and has been repurposed as a presbyopia drop. And tell me about the side effects for acyclidine versus pilocarpine. Okay, so, you know, you, you look at the side effects, all right, so really that elephant in the room is retinal detachment. And what it is, is that uh, there's been reports in the literature showing that the pilocarpine has... Uh, created, or shall we say, induce some retinal detachments. Uh, but if you take a look at the clinical studies, there's no reports of any retinal detachments. And all the studies that I've done with pilocarpine and also with acyclidine, no retinal detachment at all whatsoever. So I think what it is, is that if you take a look at the package insert, now the FDA is recommending that you need to have a retinal exam. Because if you have retinal holes, or you know if you have a history of retinal detachment, or you're high myopia, uh, these are all risk factors <laughs> of getting a retinal detachment, uh, period, without even a, using a presbyopia drop. So when you have, uh, let's say, a pilocarpine that has a ciliary spasm that can pull on the retina in very, 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 very rare cases, um, then you have a risk of that happening. And how about redness or uh, pain, you know, headaches, you know, spasms around the eye, cataracts, any kind of allergies? What kind of side effects? 
they have you yeah yeah one of yeah, one of the side effects they have is, is brow ache because what happens is is that when you have the ciliary muscle, when it tightens up, then it also is connected to the brow and that's headaches. But, you know, when you take a look, I, I had very, very small amount of headaches in the clinical trials that, that we ran. And when you look at it, you know, when you, when you, if you were to look at a package insert and see what the percentage is and say, oh my God, the percentage is this much. Oh, everybody's going to get a headache or all these people are going to get a headache. Well, you know, they don't really define the severity of the headache and they don't say how long the headache lasts or whether or not it goes away the next day or whether that's only for a few minutes or whether it's a mild headache. And they say that, you know, the vast majority of any brow ache or headache uh, is actually very, very mild. You know, the, the much, you know, the highest, the, the, the most of the most of them is actually mild. Uh, you know, moderate and severe, you don't really get that with these. So, you know, it, it's more of a transient type of thing. Because I would think it would be less because it's just working on the iris, it's not working on the ciliary body. Yes, absolutely. Again, again, you've been doing your homework. Yes, there's a, there's a less, uh, I, what I found is that there are much, much less uh, prevalence of, I, I don't even remember I even saw a headache in, in, the, in, the, in the acyclidine trial that, that we did. You know, we were talking about pupil size before. I got to ask you about this. My own wife sent me a a uh, an advertisement. And I wanted to know what I thought about pinhole glasses. You know, glasses that have these little pinholes. So I know that thousands of people are watching this at home. Then they're going to want to know. Ask about those pinhole glasses. Are they any good? So I'm going to ask the expert right here. Well, like I said before, when you use a pinhole glass, you know your your vision is very very dim. And also what happens is, is that you have no peripheral vision. You're just looking through that little pinhole. So yeah, they work. You're able to see up close, but you know, you can't see beyond that. You can't see any, per your peripheral vision is terrible and is everything very, very dim. You know, uh, you know, you could actually make your own little pinhole. I mean, you know, if you just make your finger like this and just make a little pinhole, you could just go ahead and hold that up. I guess you don't need a pinhole glass right there. So how long does it take before acyclidine works compared to pilocarpine? And how long does it last, acyclidine, compared to pilocarpine in your clinical trials? Oh, it, it was, uh, it, it got within minutes, uh, we saw it starting to take an effect. And then uh, it lasts much, much longer than pilocarpine. Pilocarpine, probably uh, will last about half a day and then uh, the acyclidine probably all day. So yeah, there's, there's just a much greater improvement in terms of, you know, how we say uh, benefit, uh, retention of benefit. That's the scientific way of saying it. The retention of benefit, how long it lasts. And how do you think this is going to affect the optometric practice? You know, people coming in and wanting this and deciding between whether well, they're going to get spectacles to help them read contact lenses. Now they're uh, multifocal contact lenses. And I know you're an investigator for contact lenses or using uh, these drops and can they be used together? Oh, absolutely. There's really no um, competition between this option and all the other options. Um, the nice thing about it is that, uh, you know, the drop will last for a day. So, you know, you can go ahead and uh, we, we call, we call, we call these presbyopia drops, uh, uh, dating drops. So in other words, uh, you know, if you want to go out on a date, you can just pop, pop that in there and read your menu when you go out on the date. You don't have to use it every day. Uh, you can use it occasionally. You can also use your reading glasses. You can also use your, uh, your regular spectacles. You can use contact lenses uh, as long as you put the drop in before you put the contact lens in and put the drop in, you know, after you take the contact lens and, you know, not, not put the drop in while you have the contact lens on the eye. But the bottom line is that it's very, very complimentary. You don't have to use it all the time. You can use it as a lifestyle drop. You can use it every day if you want. Um, there's just, you know, a lot of flexibility and, and it highly complements all the other treatments we have out there. You know, when they came out with the pilocarpine medication, the optometrists themselves, the eye doctors, really didn't accept it. There was a lot of negativity on optometric websites about that. Do you think we're gonna see that with acyclidine? And why do you think we saw that negativity? Well, we saw the negativity, as I was saying before, it's that sweet spot, it's that how, what these patients work. So in other words, then if you have somebody that's outside that sweet spot, it fails. So in other words, when it works, the patients are just like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. 
But when it doesn't work, the patient is highly, highly annoyed or highly, highly disappointed. So what happens is, is that because of that narrower sweet spot, that's the reason why I think there was a lot of failures and there was a lot of negativity that was attached to it. Now with this next generation of drops coming out, that sweet spot is greatly, greatly enlarged. I think probably the number one reason why I saw that the sweet spot was actually, or patients failed or didn't like the first generation is largely because they have to be distance corrected. They have to wear their distance classes for this drop to work. And I think that this next generation totally eliminates any of that wearing the distance corrected. You can use whatever correction you have. You can use your old pair of glasses instead of buying a new pair of glasses in order for you to use a drop. You know, I I was talking yesterday, I have a friend who's a race car driver and he doesn't want to have to wear glasses, even contact lenses when he's when he's driving, but he's presbyopic. And I was telling him about this drop, this new one that was coming about one of the previous ones. And he thought that would be perfect for him. Who do you feel are ideal patients for this type of treatment, this meiotic treatment so you could read up close that when you get over 40? You know, so far, I, I think that probably almost anybody that needs reading glasses or bifocals or progressives can give it a shot. Do you think there's anybody, any type of patient that is not a good candidate for this? Well, anybody with history of retinal detachment or retinal eye disease or anything like that, I would I would not recommend doing that. Um, for sure, you know, uh, the eye doctor uh, will be able to determine that. Uh, doing a retinal exam. But other than that, I think, uh, yeah, I, I would try it on pretty, probably probably any of the body who needs any reading glasses or, you know, any correction at near. Like I said, the sweet spot is so much larger. I mean, the age is like up to 75 years old. I mean, if you take a look at the first generation, that was like up to 50 years old or 55 years old. Now it's like huge. And can you use this with people who have had LASIK or who have had cataract surgery? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's, there, in fact, there are studies that are showing that, that uh, for patients that have had, you know, past um, history of uh, surgery, uh, eye surgery, um, it's, it works. It's successful. I mean, there's a, there's a, as we said before, there's a tremendous market. Uh, you know, there's 40% of the U.S. population is presbyopic. People are getting older and, uh, you know, people hate not being able to read up close. It's horrible. A lot of people will sacrifice their distance vision just so they can read up close. I know with contact lenses, sometimes we'll even overcorrect people and blur their distance because people hate not being able to read up close and they don't want to wear glasses. So there's a huge yeah. problem. Yeah, you know, these days, you know, I mean, a lot of it, the digital device use and everything like that, the, the visual demand is much, much greater than it has been in, you know, years past before digital devices. So yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. I mean, there are some patients that, uh, you know, are near biased. In other words, that's all they do. You know, they sit at the computer like eight hours a day. That's all they do. So really, they need to have, you know, the best near vision that they can get. Are they using this acyclidine in Europe still for glaucoma? You said it's not a very good glaucoma medicine, but I assume the people that are using it could read pretty good in Europe, even though maybe their glaucoma is getting worse and they have to use other glaucoma medicine along with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. You know, I mean, that's, you know, I was talking to Murray Fingeret, you know, the uh, glaucoma expert, the optometric glaucoma expert. And he says, you know, for years, we knew that pilocarpine uh, would give you better near vision. Um, it's not, you know, no one ever prescribes that for glaucoma anymore, but uh, they've always known, the glaucoma experts always knew that it actually works for near. And, you know, you mentioned some about the phase three clinical trials. Was there anything else that you might want to add when you were doing the trials on the people uh, with this acyclidine, this new type of medicine? Anything that you might want to add that we didn't talk about? I was just amazed that it actually increased the distance vision. So one of the things is, is that, you know, when I was saying that the old paradigm was between two to three millimeters was a sweet spot. And the old, the old way of thinking last year, you know, if you can call last year old, uh, the way of thinking was, is that if you get below two millimeters, you're going to really start dimming your distance vision. But after doing this uh, trial, bringing it below two millimeters, it actually increased the distance vision. 
So it's kind of like it had a totally opposite effect. So wh why why is it that the distance vision actually increased while opposed to thinking with the first generation actually it would decrease? Well, the reason why is is because when you get a even smaller pupil size than two millimeters, the depth of focus, or shall we say the range that you get actually is like this. And then when it hits below two millimeters, the depth of focus goes up like that. The graph shows it goes up like that. So in other words, it exponentially increases. In other words, your, your range exponentially increases when you hit below two millimeters. And that I think is the reason why that, you know, in many, many uh, uh, instances, uh, the distance vision actually was increased with acyclidine as opposed to, let's say, something like a pilocarpine. You know, we saw in the pilocarpine trials that we saw that it did increase in some of the patients, the distance vision, but acyclidine, there was, I mean, it was very, very common. Right. I mean, that's really. So, yeah. So it increases uh, again. The sweet spot increases again. I mean, that's, I mean, that's unbelievable. So we, we talked a lot about acyclidine and uh, it's not FDA approved yet, but hopefully soon, and our patients will be able to be able to enjoy this medication, and the doctors will be able to add this into their armamentarium, along with contact lenses for people that are presbyopic, along with spectacles, just something else to be able to help our help our patients. Is there anything that we've left out that uh, that you might want to mention uh, that you think that patients should know about, the public should know about? Well, like I said, you know, uh, you know, these drops are continually to get better and better and better. This is the second generation that 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 that's that's you know in the pipeline right now. Um, there are other mechanisms um, like softening the lens. Uh, so when you soften the lens, it's able to you know you bring back your accommodation. But the problem is, is that um, that those other ways of doing it have failed. I mean, it failed in clinical trials. I was part of one of the clinical trials that had a lot lens softening agent, in other words, increasing your accommodation for these patients that are presbyopic. And halfway through the trial, uh, the sponsor just pulled it because the results weren't that good. So this that is really was, right now, this is my, the most viable way of going now. That was with lipoic acid, is that correct? Yes, lipoic acid by Novartis. Uh -huh. And it was a year long study. And halfway through, uh, we've got this email saying uh, we're no longer supporting this study and stop it, which is like, whoa, and this is, this is, the study hasn't even, you know, these companies, they fully budget to, to, to last the entire length of, of time of the studies. For, so for them to pull it in the middle, that just means that, you know, they were not getting the traction uh, through something like this. Uh, so really it's like, this is like, you know, we, you know, a uh, smaller, small pupil, uh, small aperture way. Uh, that's the way to go right now. And I don't know if there's anything else on the horizon. You were talking about the corneal inlays before, you know, and that, that's actually with a smaller, um, you know, smaller millimeter size, you know, putting on the cornea. But then again, you know, you know, God designed the eye for it to be, for a smaller aperture to be at the pupillary plane, not at the corneal plane, not at the spectacle plane, but at the pupillary. I mean, that's the way the eye was designed. So in other words, if you put it on the corneal plane, that's not going to work. You're still going to have decreased peripheral vision and also you're going to have dimmer vision. And how about with the implants? Now, the implants, that's kind of interesting. I don't know really... Um, you know, I, you know, there's the EDOFs and all of those other ones that, you know, these virtual pupil sizes and everything like that. Uh, I think what it is, is that um, it has to be very, very precise. So in other words, the centering has to be very, very precise because you have these virtual pupil sizes and everything like that. But I, I don't know, what do you know, what are the success rates, Carrie? Are you familiar with that? No, I mean, I just know about it, but, you know, I never see patients that actually have something like that. So I don't think yeah. it's been embraced by the the cataract surgeons to, to do that. I, I certainly, in New Jersey, it's not very, I've never seen one. So, but mm, maybe yeah. looking at it. Yeah, I want to ask you one last question before, as we wrap up. Uh, you know, you're a researcher and a, an optometrist in, in clinical practice. Uh, tell me about what it's like to be a researcher. How organized do you have to be to be able to do something like that? 
Oh, you have to build out the entire uh, infrastructure for that. You have to have study coordinators. Um, you know, recently, four years, you know, I was working out of my old office and then I had to expand uh, into uh, recently move into a larger facility. And the reason why is because I need more space so I can run the research of it. Um, there's a lot of, you need more space. You need to have room sizes, especially with these presbyopia studies. You have to have a 15 foot throw and it can't be like a virtual throw or anything like that. It has to be a true 15 feet. They'll come in and then they'll take a tape. The, study, the, the companies will come in and take a tape measure and make sure it's 50. So I had to design an exam room that was, 15 foot uh, with a 15 foot throw um, just so I could do these presbyopia studies. Um, and then you have to expand your uh, as, uh, staffing. You have to have qualified staff to do your study coordinator as well as your normal staff that will run the uh, you know regular optometric practice. So uh, it is like building another practice essentially, uh, but I prefer to be all under one roof uh, and I know that, you know, you have a passion for optometry also, Carrie, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion, you know, I mean, optometry, you know, it's a profession for us, but it's also a hobby. And I know that, you know, you suffer from that same affliction is that it's also a hobby and it's also a passion. So, uh, you know, it's just, that's just, you know, you and I are very, very much alike. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a great profession and we help a lot of people and it's always great when there's new products that come out to make it a little easier for us to help our patients, whether, you know, we're ordering blood tests or we're diagnosing systemic disease through the eye or we're fitting an unusual type of contact lens or we're you know, dealing with a, a kid who's a baseball player and helping them with vitamins and help increasing their macular pigment with something, you know, with lutein zeaxanthin, measles zeaxanthin, helping people with diets. So there's so many things that we do in our great profession to be able to help people. And Dr. Hom, Dr. Milton Hom, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to speak to you. And uh, people want to find out more about you. How could they do it? Oh, I'm uh, so it's uh, my practice is in Southern California. We have a website. It's Canyon City Eye Care uh, dot com. Uh, you can contact me through that. Um, we also have a Facebook page also Canyon City Eye Care dot com also. Well, Dr. Milton Hahn, thank you for joining me today on the Open Your Eyes podcast with Dr. Kerry Gill. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today.